Welcome to Hiraith, the home of modern Welsh politics. Today we are joined by Will Hayward, Welsh Affairs Editor at Wales Online and author of Independent Nation, Should Wales Leave the UK? Following his previous book, Lockdown Wales, Will has taken on the challenge of writing about one of the most contested and salient topics that has come to the fore just before and during the COVID pandemic, Welsh independence. Long considered a minority interest commanding only 10 to 15% support and even only two thirds of Plaid Cymru supporters showing support for independence, the topic burst onto the wider political discussion after a series of well-attended rallies across Wales in 2019. Combined with an increasingly fractious relationship between a unionist Welsh government and a UK government intent on re-centralising power post-Brexit, support for Welsh independence gained a surprising amount of support from within the ranks of Welsh Labour and, came, and became the official policy of the Green Party. The Welsh Government has even established its own commission to explore the constitutional question under the stewardship of former Archbishop of Canterbury, Dr Rowan Williams, and Professor Laura McCaster of Cardiff University. But as with all constitutional questions, for each strongly held opinion, there are a whole raft of complicated, unsexy questions that rarely get the scrutiny or depth of discussion that they deserve. In his book, we'll ask the difficult questions of all sides of the argument, while carefully laying out the facts and quandaries of those people whose opinions are not so entrenched. Will, thank you so much for coming on today to talk to us about the book. Thanks very much. I, look, I like the idea that I was asking the unsexy questions. Well, <laughs> there, there's lots of complicated questions that you raise in that book, Will. Um, but I, the first thing I wanted to ask you is what made you write the book? I mean, you talk a little bit about the fact that the the Brexit debate was basically in the gutter. Do you think that the debate in Welsh independence is in a better place than that? Uh, I think it's... I think it is in a better place than that, but it could be because it's not as polarised as entrenched and there's not as much money been poured into making it toxic, uh, potentially. The rationale behind doing the book was because it was clear that this debate was being had. Uh, and I think when a debate has been had, the most important thing is that you're having it from the point of view of being in, as informed as possible. Because actually, debating things is really healthy. Talking about things is really healthy. Having reasonable conversations is a really good thing to do. But as we saw with Brexit, it, if you're not having answering the right questions, if your answers are essentially incorrect or misleading, it actually ends up not solving anything and it makes things worse. So the idea was, if we're going to have this conversation about Welsh independence, let's have it from a point of view as being as informed as possible. So once you decided that you were going to write the book, what was the approach to it? Who did you speak to and, and why? Oh, God, it felt like everyone. Um, <laughs> so I'm, I was coming to this. Um, I'm English by birth. I've lived in Wales my entire adult life. And I think to start with, I was very aware that I wasn't, I, I had instincts on Welsh independence. I had feelings about independence, but I didn't really have a fully formed opinion. And most of my opinions in politics and uh, have been kind of based as you grow up. You know, you debate with your parents, you debate with your friends, but not many of my family or friends were necessarily engaged with this. So I hadn't really had that kind of across a, a kitchen table discussions, which help you form those opinions. So the first, I'd say first four or five months, I was just giving people a damn good listening to really. Um, you know, sometimes I just put in social media. I'm, I'm in this pub. I'm going to be in this place for the next, you know, couple of hours. If anyone wants to talk Welsh independence, whether you support it or not, or have no idea, just come and have a chat with me. So, I just, I think to start with, it's, it, I didn't feel like I could even ask the right questions because I just didn't understand it. So I just read and listened to as many people as I could who had thought about it um, or people who wanted to know more but didn't know what to ask, you know, what sort of questions did they want answered. And after I'd done that for about probably four or five months, I felt like I was in a position to start actually looking into answering the questions that had been posed because it, it's hard because I, I had no idea what, how to even begin it. It was such a, a large task. So yeah, gave people a damn good listening to, and then uh, tried to answer some questions uh, and understand it. And it just took me in some really interesting directions. Like we don't often get to kind of learn for learning sake as adults. It was, it was, it was a really nice thing. So I just tried to research myself into being informed on it. But I think there's a bit of a challenge in that because when I started it, I actually probably naively thought there would be a, a yes side and a no side, which I would just critique both sides of. But that really isn't the case. There was a there's some people in the Welsh independence movement who thought about it a lot, but m most people who are engaging with it, it's kind of they're engaging with it through tweets and memes. And there's not really anything to critique. And then it's almost worse on the other side because there isn't really an opposition to Welsh independence. There's just kind of everyone else. Um, obviously, there's people like, you know, um, abolish the assembly, that sort of groups. But I, I don't think that's a fair opposite to the Welsh independence movement 
I mean, I, I also didn't want to do the Welsh independence job for them. I couldn't create an argument for them and then critique my own work. So it was about trying to help people answer the right questions, I suppose. In the most rambling answer, I promise the book is actually quite succinct, contrary to everything you've just seen from me, just rambling on about <laughs> it. It really is. Um, how hard did you find, you know, as you said, Will, so much of what I think a lot of people see about the Welsh independence movement is, is tweets and memes and, and what have you. Um, but so much as well of what's been written on this is quite dry academic literature. How hard did you find trying to reconcile uh, that on both sides of the argument? The thing I had to acknowledge straight away is that the people who'd done a lot of thinking about it, this wasn't really for them. Uh, this was about making the issue accessible um, for people. I mean, as you say, the, the independence movement at the moment, I, I'm not criticising how they've gone about their business so far. Um, but a lot of it has been based around, you know, sticking things on lampposts and doing loud marches. There's a real ceiling with how much you can actually achieve through that. And I actually think that they've kind of reached that ceiling already. And the problem is, once you get to that stage, you just start talking to each other and you just talk to people who agree with you and you stop actually trying to convince. And that was my uh, concern with how the debate had gone. So, yeah, I, I think um, trying to reconcile that. I mean, there's 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 a lot of very in-depth stuff out there and a lot of it is written from the point of view of people who are coming wanting independence to work. So it was about trying to critique that in a way that didn't just discount it. I mean, there, there's a lot of especially when we look at the practicalities around affording Welsh independence, there's a reason why the, the biggest chapter of the book, which almost takes up a third of the book, is can we afford it? My day job is taking complicated stuff and trying to make it accessible for, for lay people. And um, once, once I understood what I was writing about, I found it much easier to then break it down and make it a bit more accessible. I mean, just driven from Llanroos to Cardiff today, I can tell you there are millions of uh, Yes Can We stickers everywhere across Wales. <laughs> I like, lost count. What, but I suppose the heart of this question is, why do you think the issue of Welsh independence has become so much more mainstream in, in recent years? Obviously, you've written a book about COVID-19, and I think to a lot of people, that issue has been certainly important in their sort of thinking, but there's also issues like Brexit, etc. cetera. Is, do, you, do you think it is one thing, or do you think it's a myriad of, of many issues? I think Brexit and COVID has been a bit of a tipping point for a lot of people. You had many people who've come to Welsh independence through the gut. They, they feel it. It feels right. It's what the idea of Wales going its own way is an, a natural thing. It's like this culmination of this idea of nationhood. But I think those people were already at wanting an independent Wales. But I think since 2016, a lot of people have taken a look at the clear problems Wales is facing and the clear issues with the union, uh, not just for Wales, but also for England and Scotland, for that matter. And they have just seen something needs to change and they've looked at how they can bring about that change and independence is seen as the most convenient vehicle to make the changes which I think a lot of us can see are fairly obvious by the way I think that sums up the intransigence a lot of people <laughs> see in the current UK setup the fact that Welsh independence is the most easy vehicle for doing it because Welsh independence will be incredibly hard to achieve it's an absolute mountain they have to climb and the idea that that is still seen as the easiest way of solving many of Wales's problems really shows a lot of the issues that we can all see in the Union at the moment. I mean, it's a fascinating argument, isn't it? It's one you have yourself in the book is, would we be, I suppose the fundamental question is, would we be better off if we were independent? And a lot of the time the question is, well, this is already, you know, this is pretty bad already, isn't it? So how much worse could it get? We were talking about the economics, Will. Talk about your journey a bit on terms of the economics and the sort of thought processes you went through when you were you know talking about sort of maybe the detriments actually that some of the parts of being part of the union have on Wales's economy well the first chapter of the book is essentially saying why this isn't working it stresses again and again this doesn't mean independence is the answer but there's clearly problems that we have to solve so uh, let's talk about poverty I think about a quarter of people in Wales live in poverty that's 700,000 ish of the three million people that live here of the 600,000 kids that live in Wales, 200,000 of them in poverty and 70,000 of them are in extreme poverty, uh, severe poverty, sorry. That is a problem which academics, leading experts suggest that under the current system, that can't really be fixed. That can't be fixed here in Wales anyway. And this has happened within the union. This hasn't, Wales hasn't joined the union um, already poor. I mean, Wales has, as anyone knows, that concept of Wales has pretty much been in the union. In order to take ways of solving this, so 
improving infrastructure is a massive way of improving productivity and making helping areas which are poor become less poor. Um, but we've seen with HS2, haven't we, the, the sleight of hand about classing HS2 as an England and Wales project. I mean, I've written extensively on this. There's the fact that essentially Wales has been ripped off for five billion pounds because apparently being able to get to North Wales to London quicker offsets it means it's an England and Wales project putting aside the fact that actually it benefits Scotland far more than it does Wales because all the lines run north to south and actually it hurts the South Wales economy I think it's to the tune of 200 million pounds a year that decision was made because it was expedient to um, save some money but the fact that for that five billion pounds we could fund the South Wales um, metro which would connect the valleys up with um, the more uh, uh, economically prosperous hubs uh, along the coast. Uh, you could build the Swansea Bay Metro, you could connect um, Aberystwyth and Swansea by train, you could integrate the North Wales lines with Merseyside, all of that you could do if Wales got its fair share of the money. But no, we're going to be able to get to London slightly faster from Bangor. That's, that's, that's the benefit. I think that's just symbolises the fact that actually there's not a real drive within Westminster to solve this problem. Uh, I mean, uh, this is a very succinct way of talking about it. This is the whole first chapter of the book. But I think this feeling that Wales, things aren't getting better and things aren't going to get better as we currently are. So something needs to change. Now, whether independence is the answer to that or the most easy vehicle for that to happen, I think is actually massively up for debate. I don't think independence, I think there's a lot of questions the independent movement needs to answer. It doesn't mean they can't answer them, but they haven't answered them yet. I suppose uh, a few people listening to this would probably tell me to just ask the straight question, which is, can Wales afford to be independent? Um, <laughs> I would uh, say this took me 30,000 words and I still waffled around it. I think this is where the independent movement needs to move on. The amount of times over the last couple of weeks I have seen people say, because we've had very little rain, everyone's like, Wales' is water has been stolen. We could bankroll independent Wales on the back of this water. You can't. That doesn't add up. The maths isn't there. It would be if you wanted to sell water to England at a price which would actually in any way come in close to closing Wales' budget deficit. Uh, fiscal deficit so between what it earns and what it spends um you it would be much cheaper for england to just to take the salt out of seawater that, that it just doesn't add up that doesn't work and also the parts of england that needs the most water is in the southeast and it is incredibly expensive to transport water it's very heavy there is no water grid like there is an electric grid in terms of can we afford it the conclusion i kind of come to in the book is if you are making a decision based on Welsh in, on your view on Welsh independence, based on whether you will be a thousand pounds richer or poorer at the end of it, don't even consider it. Don't even bother. The only way that you can consider whether independence financially pays off is if you want to see incredibly drastic change, which will also include changing what we value. So I think even the most passionate indie uh, supporters, if they really look at it, will admit that there are going to be fewer iPhone, new iPhones in independent Wales. But that might come at the value that you actually work a four-day week. Uh, that might come at a value that your health care, uh, your social care as you get older is fully funded. You only should be supporting Welsh independence if you want to see really massively radical change in Wales. And then you need to be really sure that the radical change that you want to see is what's going to happen. Like if you're voting for independence because you want to see a, co a socialist Wales, you need to be really sure that's going to happen. If you're only voting for it because you want to see a republic, you need to be very sure that that's the version that's going to happen. And that's why these conversations need to be had. So Wales could exist absolutely independent. It needs to so answer a lot of questions, both in terms of how it's going to make its money, um, because Wales, if it's independent, is going to have to import. And if it's importing, it's going to have to export. I mean, Wales isn't going to make all its own pharmaceuticals. It's not going to make all its own cars. When you go around the supermarket, look in your um, trolley at all those things that haven't been produced in Wales. And I would guess it's about 95% of it. So you need to work out how, as a country, you're going to pay for those things. And you can't just say general phrases like, we're going to invest in the industries of the future, because that just doesn't mean anything. You have to have a realistic plan, and that plan needs to be in place before you even start realistically campaigning for this to happen imminently. Say in the book that Wales needs to find its own niche if it's to mm. be prosperous. So many people, like you said, would say water or, or energy. But doing your journey with this book, did you come any closer to seeing what Wales's niche could be? So, as I, as I said, the, my, my job with the book wasn't to, to do the independent size jobs for them. I did conclude that exporting stuff from under people's feet just doesn't work. I, I start the financial chapter with a quote from an economist called Koto from um, the uh, Wales Governance Centre, who says, you know, we had a 
an economy based on exporting resources before and ended up with mass unemployment and hundreds of thousands of people moving out of Wales. Like the real resource in Wales is the people in Wales. It, there's no quick fix with, oh, we'll just export X, Y or Z commodity. But what I did suggest is, was I looked into the feasibility of tidal power. Tidal power, Wales is incredibly well placed to do it. Just drive along the coast, look at all the inlets. It's really well suited for creating tidal power. Now, producing that electricity in of itself will not balance the books. It, it just doesn't add up. I, I go through the maths a bit more in, in the book, but you can't bankroll the Welsh exchequer on the back of selling electricity from uh, tidal power. But what you can do is create an industry where you've got expertise in order to be able to help other countries produce tidal power. So, you know, we all talked about why we needed Huawei to create our 5G networks. You know, there's going to be a real drive from countries all over the world over the next decades to create cheap green energy. And if Wales is the place where that is produced, it's where all the component parts of those turbines are produced. It's where all the expertise on how that works. If you make Wales a centre for tidal power, then actually you've got, that's that's a really good industry that could create and generate money and jobs for Wales. It can't just be that. We can't just look at that. But that's the sort of conversations we need to be having. But you also need to be getting in on the ground floor of these things. By the time that lay people are having that conversation, it's pretty much too late. I mean, I finish part of one of the, um, the chapters uh, saying we need to, if, if you're an advocate for independence, you need to start building the nation you want to see free. And obviously that's hard because a lot of the economic levers are not held here in Wales, but a lot of them are. And a lot of the changes that we need to see are actually in our power to do now. So uh, Wales could afford to be independent. It would come at a cost to standards of living, very likely in the short to medium term, but it depends on what you value. So if you change what you're going to value, if you value, you know, more socially just society, then actually that could be that could be good. Also, if you're incredibly poor already, and you haven't got disposable income, you're not haven't got a two car household. Perhaps, um, perhaps it's an easier sell to you. One of the very, you know, there are many things I find interesting in the book, Will. Don't worry. But one of the things I found very interesting was the conversation you have relating to currency. Would you be able to sort of praise that for, for our listeners? Yeah, sure. So you, you've essentially got three options when it comes to currency. You keep the pound. You take on another currency, most likely the euro. Uh, it make much more sense than the dollar, just in terms of who we um, trade with. Um, or you can create a Welsh currency. So the issues with keeping the pound are you have no control over monetary policy. You're not setting interest rates. You can't print your own money. The advantages are you have the same currency as your big, biggest trading partner, okay, England, um, and you have that continuity straight off the gate. Uh, I don't see any credible way that an independent Wales keeps the pound, because why have you gone through all of this effort, all of this upheaval to still not control your own interest rates? And by the way, the Bank of England who set those interest rates will now not even consider the situation in Wales. So I don't think that's feasible. I think that is then a similar argument against the euro. I don't think that remotely works, especially in the medium term, short medium term. So your only other option really is you're going to create your own currency. So let's call it the punt, which actually worked well for calling that chapter taking a punt you essentially create your own currency. Now you've got two options then. You can peg that currency to another currency. So you say one punt is worth you know, 70 pence, or you could peg that to a, a range. You could say a punt always is worth between 60 pence and 80 pence, and then you have to maintain that peg. That is an incredibly hard thing to do with a new currency because there will be a lot of speculators in the world who are betting against that currency, who will try and break that peg in order to make a lot of money. And in order to maintain that peg, you need to have a central bank, which is prepared to put everything in to maintaining that peg. It's a, it's a very, it's a hard thing to do. I mean, speculators have tried to break the Hong Kong dollar. They couldn't do that, but that's also got a lot of money behind it and a lot of credibility, which actually comes with just existing for a long period of time. So your other option is you then float that currency. So your currency just goes up and down based on um, supply and demand. There's a lot of reasons why that there could be advantages to that. I mean, if you have a really devalued Welsh currency, suddenly Wales exports are really, really cheap um, and there'll be lots of demand for them. But obviously you've still got to import a lot of stuff, which has suddenly become a lot more expensive. But there's also the practicalities. Think about the border. If I'm a doctor, I live on the Wirral, um, but I work in Wrexham uh, Mailer Hospital. I'm, am I going to want to get paid in punts? Do I want to be taking back my punts to go and when I live on the Wirral? Uh, for the flip side, if you're, you might be a, um, a nurse who's working, who lives in Wrexham, but works on Merseyside, who's now paying in pounds and can live like a queen or king, obviously. <laughs> um, but it's, this is massive, massive upheavals that those answers need to be there. It, 
And, and I, I use an example in the book. So what you'll quite often hear people, advocates for independence say is, well, we'll keep the pound initially and then we'll move to, to having a punt. But there's um, a really good example of how this can work with Czechoslovakia. So Czechoslovakia, when it became the Czech Republic and Slovakia, um, they had the krona. And when they broke up, they decided to keep the same currency for, uh, for several years in order to ma like mitigate the upheaval. The problem was Slovakia is much poorer than the Czech Republic or Czechia. What you found is that everybody who was living in Slovakia moved all their money over to the Czech Republic because they knew that the second those two currencies split, the Slovak krona was going to plummet and the Czech krona was going to go up. So you had this really weird position where um, Slovakian people who owe Czech businesses or Slovakian businesses that own Czech businesses money were desperately trying to pay off their debts before their currency tumbled. And people in Czechia who wanted to pay off Slovak creditors were waiting because they thought, well, if I can just wait another bit of time, that currency is going to be worth nothing and I can pay it off much cheaper. So they actually had to end it after just a couple of months um, and put currency controls on actually um, moving money. So this whole thing is fraught with difficulty and there has to be acknowledgement that this is extremely complicated, so much more complicated than Brexit. Ah, uh, you've led me to the perfect lead on there, Will. Thank you very <laughs> much. It's almost like you knew. So uh, one of the questions I, I have personally to this, because it's very interesting, is the extent to which support for Welsh independence is driven by a desire to rejoin the EU. To, did you find that when you when you were doing the work for the book? Yeah, I was actually taken aback by the amount of people, especially since 2016, who have come to Welsh independence in part as a vehicle for getting their EU membership back. I mean, there, there's a lot we can unpack here. I mean, you, you can talk about the fact actually large parts of the world voted to leave, but I, I, I'm not really going to go into that now. But let's look at the practicalities around EU membership. So I'm going to put aside the fact that if you've got Welsh independence, you have just campaigned for years to leave what you perceive to be an unaccountable Westminster and get your sovereignty back to Wales. The idea that you will then immediately cede that to Brussels is crazy. If you're annoyed that you've reduced the amount of MPs, um, they've reduced the amount of MPs in Wales um, that go to Westminster, how are you going to feel when you've got five uh, MEPs? Like, come on. But let's put all that aside. Let's talk about timeframes. So realistically, if you are thinking, I want EU membership, uh, I want Welsh independence in order to become an EU citizen again, you are going to need Plaid Cymru probably to win the next two Senate elections because they have said that in their first term, they would hold an indicative referendum and in the next one, they would hold a full referendum. So we're talking four years time to the next um, uh, election. So say Plaid Cymru win that and then five years later, they win another one. So we're already kind of getting on for 15 years down the line. If Plaid were to then hold a referendum and win it, you've then got the negotiation between the rest of the UK and Wales. Now, let's be really, really generous and say that takes five years, which is how long Brexit took. And there's a very good argument to say it should take a lot longer than five years. You're now 20 years down the line. So say Wales leaves 20 years. The idea that the first thing a well, an independent Wales is going to do is go, oh, yeah, we should probably join the EU now is, is madness. That isn't going to be the case. So let's say be really, really kind and say three years, three years after Wales is independent, we decide we want to join the EU. So you then hold a referendum on that. That takes, you know, six months. So you say we're 23 years down the line and Wales wins that referendum. You then begin the negotiation with the EU. I mean, that referendum could happen at the end of negotiation, but at some point you're going to hold a referendum. You then have a negotiation with the EU, at which point for over two decades, you have not been in the EU. So you have diverged quite a long way. Um, even if there is incredible goodwill within the EU, which I think actually there probably would be, although there'd be some issues, especially around Spain, especially around um, countries which haven't recognised Kosovo, uh, such as Cyprus and Greece. That negotiation takes five years. Another, that is a generous time frame. We're now coming up, for getting on for 30 years on before we're going to be joining the EU. Now, bear in mind, 30 years ago, the EU as we know it now didn't exist. So what you've done is essentially you've, I mean, I mean a lot of you might be dead. <laughs> in the nicest possible way. Um, I don't think it is unreasonable to want your EU citizenship back. I just think if that is your primary motivation for Welsh independence, you are taking a very long way to get there. And the thing you might recognise might not even be the same anymore. And actually, you might not even want to join it. I mean, look at what happen is happening in Hungary. Look at what is happening in Poland. You know, the world could be very, very different then and likely will be very different. I, I think I should say, I actually hesitate to even put a chapter about the EU in the book in the first place, because it was for an independent Wales to decide. It's up to an independent Wales if it joins. 
Um, but because so many people were motivated by that desire to regain their EU citizenship, I felt like I had to put it in there and at least explore it. But I, I think if that is your motivation, if that's your main motivation for Welsh independence, you might need to rethink it, frankly. You've, I think, quite well laid out all the very many difficulties relating to Wales joining the EU. But I think one of the ones that is sometimes under underplayed is the issue of borders and the internal UK single market relating mm -hmm. to trade and export between England and Wales. Did that come up much when you were talking to people? Yeah, so, um, well, it came up a lot for people who live near the border. People in Carmarthenshire didn't seem to care, funnily enough, uh, too much about it at all. I mean, I, I actually dedicate an entire chapter to the border and I explore practicalities if Wales was in the EU, if it wasn't in the EU. I mean, if, if Wales joins the EU and the relationship between the EU and the UK is as it is now, that would be one of the biggest acts of self-sabotage Wales could do. The idea that you can have anything other than a hub, uh, a completely frictionless border between uh, Wales and the rest of the UK. I actually personally don't think the situation in 10, 15 years between the UK and the EU will, will be, I don't think we'll have the hard Brexit that we see now. I think after a while you, you stop wanting to cut off your nose to spite your face. Um, I just don't think anyone will make a big deal of it if they, if they can get away with it. But yeah, the, the border is a massive thing. I mean, Wrexham, Denbyshire, Flintshire are some of the most commuted out of areas of the UK for work. Like the amount of people who leave those counties to go to other counties to work, mainly in England, uh, is massive. 50% of people in Wales live within 25 miles of England. Supply chains going back and forth across that border is so much more complicated than it is between Scotland and England. It, it's, it's a completely different kettle of fish. I, I drove the entire length of the England and Wales border where you can drive it. And I mean, there's, there's, a, there's a pub where the border goes through the middle of the bar. Um, and back when they had like dry Sundays where you, could, you couldn't drink in Wales on a Sunday, but you could in England, people would drink on the English side of the bar and go for, go for a wee on the Welsh side. I mean, this is so complicated. You can't have any friction there. So this idea that you can detach yourself through independence from the rest of the UK is just not true. I mean, take go back to energy. You can't send electricity from North Wales to South Wales without going into England. It, it, so if you want to have a Welsh grid, you're going to have to build one. And tell you what, if you think that HS2 will take a while to pay off, try rebuilding a grid for Wales. You're going to be working with England, UK, whatever it is. I'm not I stress in the book not to prejudge the decision of the people of Scotland. That, that border is, is a huge amount of question. And actually, a lot of the advocates for independence who I spoke to don't actually live that near to it. And I think you can't pretend that this isn't a situation because to do that is to ignore the lived realities of all the people you're expressing the desire to apparently free from the UK so you can't ignore the, the realities of the border and you need good answers to it. We're going to keep on really fun complicated stuff now Will <laughs> sorry um, so we're going to talk about the UK's constitution a little bit so it's famously uncodified and it changes a, a lot do you think it's currently working well and do you think there are any real forces willing to to change it from the centre? Um, I, I think it's. I think it's. I mean, it's awful, isn't it? What we've currently got. If you were creating how a country would work right now, the idea that you would create how, how devolution has been set up is just is just madness. I think I use the example in the book of if you're a youth worker, you know, a lot of the services you have to engage with, like housing and um, local government um, uh, and education, are all controlled by the Welsh government. But like justice, which is a huge part of their job. Is not um, so there's not much joined up thinking there you know it, it's very hard to tackle large problems when the key instruments for dealing with those problems are controlled by completely different people with completely different agendas it doesn't mean devolution can't work it just needs to be rationalized and it also needs to be accepted by all the component parts that it does work i mean we saw this with um take if there's a dispute between any of the component parts of the UK. So Boris Johnson, well, at time of recording, just about, <laughs> is um, uh, the Prime Minister of the UK and essentially doubles up as the Prime Minister, the First Minister of England, which I, I think I, I've, I've said many times is the equivalent of the Governor of California, also been the President. It just doesn't work. It's mad. But if you say, take the, the £1 billion, pounds, uh, for want of a better word, bung, that the DUP got over um, supporting Brexit. That was take 
broken up by the Scottish and Welsh governments because they believe there should be a Barnet consequential for that. When the UK government, they, they raise that in the forum with which you can raise it, it's, uh, um, it's kind of drawn up as part of the UK's unwritten, well, uncodified constitution, sorry. And the UK government actually has the power in those um, disputes, not only to rule on the result of a dispute, but also decide if there was a dispute to be heard in the first place. And that, funnily enough, they decided that actually there wasn't a dispute even to be heard. I mean, this isn't, these aren't the symptoms of a functioning polity. I mean, if we're going to go all COVID on it, the UK has a lot of underlying health conditions. If you were looking like this, I mean, the UK is, should be self-isolating its house and Germany should be dropping off its shopping at the end of the drive. It, it just doesn't, it doesn't work how it's currently constituted. I mean, during, during COVID, there was an outbreak in prisons of COVID and prisons are run by the UK government, apart from some which are run by G4S because they're private. Um, but healthcare in prisons is run by the Welsh government. This, this isn't rational. And that doesn't mean that situation can't work, but it has to be, it has to be the accepted reality of what we're dealing with from all the component parts. And that just isn't the case at the moment. You describe in the book the UK government as being aggressively unionist. I think we've used muscular unionism in the past on the, the pod, but what do you mean by that? And, and what impact do you think it is having on the constitutional debate in the UK? I think the problem is at the moment, the UK government at present has a very specific view of what union the union is and what Britishness is. And the problem is, as Richard Wynne Jones, for instance, has looked into this a lot. Britishness means different things to different people in different parts of the UK. If you define yourself as British in England, you're likely to be Remain voting left of centre. If you decide yourself as British in Wales, you're likely to be right of centre and vote leave. But if you decide yourself as Welsh in Wales, you're likely to find yourself, a, you're likely to be Remain voting and left of centre. So people who define themselves as Welsh in Wales have a, a much more in common with people who define themselves as British in England. Actually, the only thing that um, people who define themselves as English and people who decide to find themselves as Welsh have in common is that they would both like a uh, separate English, essentially an English parliament, for want of a better word. I think what the UK government are trying to do at the moment, there's two strands to their muscular unionism. There's this kind of the flag mania stuff, which gets everyone riled up, which actually I don't think really makes much of a difference. to the. If you want an example of how much flags matter, go to the valleys and look how many EU flags there are on every single project and then look at how many people in the valleys vote to stay in the EU. I don't think the flags does anything. I mean, it's funny when people are sticking like 20 foot flags on buildings and stuff, but it doesn't matter. The things that I think do matter are this view of, this death by a thousand cuts to devolution that we have seen through things like the Internal Market Act. There is nothing incompatible about Britishness and Welshness, but the current way that Britishness has been pushed, I think it's forcing people to make a decision between their Britishness and their Welshness. And if they force people to do that, they might actually find they really dislike the answer. It, and it isn't necessary. The UK has the potential to be the answer to a lot of an example to the rest of the world in how you can have a multinational country um, which functions and works well and is able to acknowledge the individualness of those coherent those separate nations and still allow them to to work together they, this idea of you know we're, we're getting forced into smaller and smaller silos around the world in, in every single way you can imagine and actually if we can create a uk where actually different nationalities and ideas of nationhood are not threatened and they're actually able to thrive, that would be an incredible achievement. That would be a real something to bequeath to the world. Um, I'm immensely sceptical that the current government even sees that that is a problem um, because they've got their own view of Britishness and our current system of first past the post means they only have to appeal to a small um, group of people who happen to all live in a fairly similar geographic location. So you, you do mention, you mentioned at the beginning here, that there isn't really an anti-independence group. Uh, that there isn't a, you know, a, a group that's coalescing around this anti-independence position. There's just basically everybody else. But do you think there's the potential that those people who do appear to be the, the unionists, quote unquote, in the UK government, have the potential to do maybe more damage to their own argument than they, they could foresee? I think the union has to keep proving itself to the um, component parts of that union. Yeah, uh, I, I, I agree with you. I think they could do a lot of damage to their own cause. I think the problem is when, when David Cameron allowed a, um, the referendum to be held in Scotland, that was an admission that the decision on the future of 
the UK lies within the people of the component parts of it. So the decision on the future of Scotland actually ultimately lies with the people of Scotland. That set that precedent. You know, people in Wales have voted consistently um, with increasing uh, passion is probably a long word. I don't know if anyone's passionate about devolution, apart from a few nerds. Um, we're increasingly loudly in favour of um, uh, devolution and trying to row back from that is, I mean, we, we've just had people vote in an election who for the first time have, for first generation, who have grown up exclusively under devolution. But this is what the UK is to these people. This is what Wales is. This is Wales' part in there. They're, they're happy with their Welshness. They're proud of their Welshness. They're, uh, the idea that you'd, you know, not raise a kid bilingually if you could now is just insane. You just wouldn't do that. And that's come a long way in 40 years. So, yeah, I, I think that the way that the, the current UK government is positioning itself, it's it's defending a union which many people don't see as existing. And there is a union still there, which has a lot of merit and there's good. you could make strong arguments for it. But they're, they're not drawing any attention to it. And if anything, they're eroding that. How well do you think Wales is represented within the UK government? I think we all remember figures like John Redwood and his terrible miming toward, uh, of Henard and Haddai. What was your assessment of the appointment of, of Robert Buckland as, as Secretary uh, of as State? Do you, do you think that this still shows us a little bit, as you say in the book, that Wales, Wales is viewed a little bit less important in the union? And do, you well, think, do you think it could be considered maybe even the lowest job in, in the cabinet? Well, yeah, I mean... Yeah, it probably is. I mean, it's the punishment. It's where you stick the person who could be quite loud. You don't want them on the back benches, but you don't want to give them any prestige. Historically, I actually think that the position of Secretary of State for Wales is completely pointless now. I mean, there's, there's, they've got no power. I mean, there used to be 3,000 people working under that person. Now I'd be surprised if they have 20. It, it's, it's just, it's a non-office. It's, its role is no longer to represent Wales in Cabinet. It's to represent the UK government in Wales. It, it doesn't function. I, I had a much bigger issue with that being a bit of a joke role when um, that person had actual power, when that person had control ultimately over, well, I say over schools and hospitals, over the quangos that ran those schools and hospitals. So, I mean, I, I just think it's a complete, it, it's just, it's lip service to it. And it, it, it's, it's, a, it's a byproduct of a system which we now thankfully don't have. But it, it could be a very useful role if done diligently in a, a very kind of, you know, if it was done well, a, a good Secretary of State for Wales could be a real force for helping Wales and helping the UK. Um, but it has of late been, since Brexit particularly, has essentially been, it's, a, it's been a representative of the UK government in Wales. And like, what's the point in that? Let's talk a little bit then about the politics of Welsh independence internally within Wales. So you talk then about Plaid Cymru, needing to win potentially two successive elections in Wales in order to get this independence referendum. I suppose the question I have now is, do you think it's more likely that Plaid Cymru will win power or that the Welsh Labour Party, party suddenly decides that it wants to support Welsh independence? Um, <laughs> at risk of ruining my sales, I'm not sure how likely any of those things are. <laughs> <laughs> I don't see why Welsh Labour politically need to shift their position. They're, they're positioned perfectly for taking advantage of this awakening of Wales's devolved consciousness, this increasing feeling of Welshness. I mean, they're, they're advocating for home rule, which is so far from what we currently have that actually they're, they're kind of radical. There's nowhere for Plaid really to go for that than beyond independence. I mean, my, I, I'm, I was flabbergasted that Plaid Cymru put independence front and centre of their election campaign for the last Senate elections. I mean, there's this, I'll, sort of, I'll call it a myth, there's this myth that the Welsh Labour government handled COVID well in Wales. It, it, by almost every measure, it was it didn't do very well. It, this, this idea that because compared to, well, this perception that compared to England, Wales did well, which actually I still take issue with, because actually I think if you look at the wave where the Welsh government actually had control of the pandemic, that's when most of the deaths were. Uh, in that second wave, there's there's a huge list of things that you can level at the Welsh government for how they failed during COVID. But so many people see that as criticism of Wales itself, which is an endless source of fury to me. Now, don't get me wrong, I do actually understand why, if you are a supporter of devolution, why you would be hesitant to criticise the Welsh government, because it, there's a wider debate here that you don't want to say something which will be used as a stick to beat devolution with. But ultimately, the biggest the biggest selling point for Welsh independence is a functioning Welsh government. And 
I don't know how you can look at the COVID response and think it was anything other than terrible. I mean, and I'd like I'd say, well, we'll find out in the um, the inquiry, but they're not going to hold an inquiry, are they? So um, despite the fact they made great political capital out of how well they they handled that. So I don't think there is any uh, inclination for going back to your question. I don't think there's any inclination. I'm going to dismount from this high horse in a minute, I promise you. Um, I don't think there's any inclination for Welsh Labour to change their position for advocating home rule. And I think Plaid Cymru, um, having gone into the last election, not hammering the Welsh government for what were clear errors and being a proper opposition, they went in with independence. And then they did better in the areas of Wales we know are naturally going to support independence. And they lost their heartland. They lost their uh, only seats they had in the valleys. So, I mean, I don't think they they could focus on independence and actually win a majority, but they have to draw that line between how independence will actually fix the actual issues people have. As part of the research of the book, I just sat on Porth High Street for a, for a day and I spoke to every single person who came past about independence. Um, lots of people were really open to talking. Some people were not open to talking, but, um, you know, most of the issues that they had were jobs, the town centre, parking, you know, actual things that you can see every day. And Plaid haven't even come close to drawing that line between how independence is going to solve these actual issues that people have. So until they can do that, I'm immensely sceptical that they'll be able to get off the ground. But obviously, if they were to read this book, they'd realise there are actually good questions for them to be answering and um, they can actually do this. But um, uh, we're, we'll see. So, yes, I'm sceptical about both of those things been said to me an awful lot and I'm sure you had numerous conversations that went like this when you were doing the research for the book but there's a lot of people who say that in order to trust in independent Wales they'd want to see Wales run better with the powers we already have did, mm. did that actually come up a lot it came up a lot from people who've thought about it I think if you've come to independence through you know through social media and through memes and through bucket hats like you're going to be you haven't necessarily delved in, and that's not disparaging people and saying that they haven't thought about it. A lot of the vast, vast majority of people who I spoke to about independence really care about it and they're really driven towards it and they they have given it some thought. But most people absolutely felt that way, um, I would say. I think some people, they don't necessarily draw that connection. They The Welsh government to them is a positive thing and it running Wales is good. So if it messes up a few times, doesn't do, you know, runs, you know, has two year waiting lists in hospitals, you know, schools are not doing that well. It doesn't matter because it's not run from Westminster. Whereas actually, I think the majority of people actually do see that they, this, this needs to be fixed. It, it's tricky because there's, there's different groups of people who have come to independence. Some of them have come to it in quite a superficial way and they tend not to, criticised the Welsh government as much. There's some people who have assessed the need for independence and are quite politically engaged who can see that there's a huge range of things in Wales that are run incredibly poorly and we could literally fix these things right now, uh, but we haven't. And we don't need independence to make our hospitals and schools better. There's an argument that we need independence, uh, well, we need significant change, not necessarily independence, to tackle poverty and to really properly fund schools and hospitals. But there's a lot of bureaucratic things within the Welsh NHS that I could point to right now and say, God, we could actually tackle that if there wasn't a lot of vested interests. I mean, I, it, it seems it seems low hanging fruit, but I mean, we've got seven health boards in a, for a population the size of Greater Manchester. If I want to send a, a nurse, if I want a nurse to stop working at an Iron Bevan health board and working Cardiff and Vale health board, I'm basically moving someone from Sainsbury's to Tesco. Um, it, you've got a, it, it's a new organization like that is insane that's madness especially if you know something like a pandemic happens and you need to shift resources very quickly and this is stuff that could be th fixed now so I think there's an acknowledgement from most people that we could do things better in Wales but I think we need to be far more vocal about um, addressing that. One of the things that we've sort of got used to in, in politics in Wales and in the UK is the sort of fractious nature of debate and how sometimes there feels as though there's there's no good answer. There's no way of being able to reconcile all these different views and these different feelings and, and ideologies. You do talk a little bit about Quebec and the process that Quebec went through in order to sort of get to where it is now. What lessons do you think Wales could, and the UK more generally, could learn from Quebec and the process it went through during its referendums? You know, this was actually one of my favourite bits of research in the book. Was So Quebec came incredibly close, like it, it was mad how close Quebec came to voting to break from Canada. But now, if you were to go to Quebec, 
I mean, there's people who still support Quebec independence, but it, it's not a major issue. And what that demonstrates is the fact that it is possible to row back from being very close to leaving. And funny enough, they didn't do that by getting everyone to speak English and putting Canadian flags everywhere. They actually did it by creating an environment where people were essentially self-governing within a larger organization, uh, within a, um, a larger country. The things you can learn from Quebec, I mean, federalism um, and the devolution of powers is absolutely baked into like Canadian political culture. So Canada is actually a bit of a weird one because the original constitution of Canada was supposed to have a really strong central government and really weak states. Whereas in the US, it was supposed to, it was the opposite way around. You're supposed to have um, really strong states and a weak central government. And actually they've both gone in the opposite directions. So Canada now has really, really strong states and actually a relatively weak central government. And the reason for that is in Canada, anything that wasn't listed on the constitution automatically reverts to the states there. And back when they were drafting that constitution, things like education and health weren't really even things, but now they're massive. And these things are, are with the states. So the, can, the Canadian guy I spoke to told me um, there's a joke in, in Canada where all the countries come together to discuss an elephant. The US delegates all talk about the power of the elephant. The British delegates all talk about the empire of the elephant. Um, the French delegates, uh, delegates, um, uh, delegates all talk about whether the elephant's a really good lover. And the Canadian delegates all talk about whether the elephant is a federal responsibility. Uh, it's absolutely baked into their entire political culture. And that means that everything about how the central government and the, um, the devolved governments in Canada is all about how it all works together. And what they've also done is have a coherent, uh, they've got a very good um, system of shifting payments from uh, richer states to poorer states, uh, of which Quebec is a net recipient. Um, and that actually played quite a big role in the eventual decision not to leave. Uh, so the thing you could also learn from Quebec is Quebec's, in terms of the, the relative sizes. So Quebec is actually a very large province. I've been saying states all the way through, it's actually a province. Um, it's actually a very large province within Canada, whereas Wales compared to England is not. That is a huge mismatch. The, like I think England is 85% of the UK population. That's a mismatch that needs to be solved. So from Canada, you can learn that you tackle calls for independence by actually addressing the grievances that have been raised. To make it sustainable, you have to have a proper transfer of payments, which is entrenched and baked in to the system. You have to have people who are willing to, on both sides, who are willing to make that system work. And you also need to not have a massive mismatch in power between the relative component parts of that union. And that, they're big questions to answer. Will, I thank you so much for coming to talk to us today. I, I have one more question before you go. So it's, and it's about you. It's about your own personal views on this matter. Where were you, do you think, at the beginning of the book and do you think that's changed now you've written it? No, I appreciate it. But given I've given, written a toolkit for people forming their opinions, the fact that my opinion is about to be so woolly might be just <laughs> fucking rubbish. It's um, not. I can guarantee you it's absolutely not. <laughs> my, when, before I started, I, was, I actually thought that Welsh independence was a matter of the heart and whether it, you wanted it or not was simply down to your gut, how you felt. Do you feel Welsh? Then, yeah, why not? I, I just thought it was completely unaffordable. Now I've gone through all this, my main overwhelming feeling is how completely unsustainable the current system is. I am yet to be persuaded that independence is the way in which to solve this. But I am completely and utterly signed up to the fact that we can't continue as we currently are. And neither should England, neither should Scotland. Um, I try and Northern Ireland is so immeasurably more complicated. I try not to draw the same comparisons. We can't stay where we are at the moment. It, it doesn't work. There's, I've always got that inclination that actually it, it would be simpler to reform the UK. And I mean, you can argue the UK isn't incapable of reform, but actually in the last 25 years since devolution, the UK has been in a state of incredible flux. You might not always like the direction it's gone in, but things have changed. If you want to make change in Wales, if you want Welsh independence, the only people you have to convince is a majority of people in Wales. If you want to change the whole of the UK, you've got to convince over half the people in the whole of the UK, which actually, so if I was to advocate for, in, for change, I can see why people see independence as a convenient vehicle. At the moment, I'm, I'm, very, um, I'm very practical in how I think 
I think that the challenges of getting independent, we need to solve issues like poverty, climate change, democratic deficit. We need to say, we need to be say, they're solving that yesterday. I'm hesitant that I think it would take quite a long time to get Welsh independence to the point it needs to be. Not just that the majority of people do it, but for Wales to be at a point it's ready to be independent. So before I was probably just completely anti-independence. Um, now, you're the only people I've actually, <laughs> I've actually been this open with. Now I, I would say I could be convinced, but I'm not. That's probably where I'd be at. Well, thank you so much for coming on to talk to us today. If people want to hear more from you, uh, where can they go and find you on Twitter? I am at Will Hay Cardiff. The Ark Will, thank you very much. If you haven't already done so by the time you're listening to this, please order or buy in any bookshop. Independent Nation, Should Wales Leave the UK by Will? It is an absolute brilliant read and you, you, have to, you just have to go and buy it. Um, thank you so much for listening to the pod today. If you've liked what you've heard, please don't forget to find us on Twitter and Facebook at Pod, or please visit our website, walespolitics.com. Thank you for listening to Hereith. If you like what you heard, please don't forget to subscribe, rate and review.